Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's Meet the Analysts webinar, U.S. Programmatic Display Trends, Ad Spending, Innovation, and Consolidation. I'm your host, Paul Verna, Principal Analyst at Insider Intelligence in New York, and I'm joined by my colleague, Analyst Evelyn Mitchell, also in New York. Hi, Evelyn. Great to have you here. Hi there, Paul. Glad to be here. Now, before we get into the main presentation, I'd like to thank Marketing Solutions, a division of T-Mobile USA, for making today's webinar possible. And I'd like to welcome Mike Peralta, Vice President and General Manager. Mike is joining us from New York. Hi, Mike. Hey, Paul. Happy to be here. Looking forward to it. So a few things before we dive in. We have a lot of information to share, but there's no need to take notes. We'll email you a link to view the slides in the full recording, but we do want you to participate. So just use the window on the lower right-hand side of your screen to submit questions at any time during the presentation. We'll get to as many as we can during the Q&A. So with that, Evelyn, let's get started. What's on the agenda today? Thanks, Paul. On the agenda for today, First, we'll go over some spending trends from our latest forecast in programmatic digital display. We'll look at top level ad spend and then break things out by device, format, and transaction method. Next, we'll dive into some market conditions that are shaping programmatic display this year and next, namely identity resolution and functions of maturation in the marketplace. Then we'll go through some key takeaways. So let's get started with our programmatic display ad spending forecast. Our definition of programmatic digital display advertising is quite broad. It encompasses a lot, really any digital advertising that is automated in some capacity. So video and static formats across the ecosystem, native ads, ads on social networks like Facebook and Twitter, digital out of home. If automation plays a role in serving the ad, that spend is included in our estimates. Now, Programmatic display ad spending was significantly above trend last year. Isn't surprising when you look at digital ad spending overall. You see that 2021 bump appear in almost every digital media ad spending forecast we have. Now, although growth will slow this year, advertisers will still spend a healthy $123 billion in programmatic display. For context, that's over 90% of digital display ad spending. It's more than half of all digital ad spending and almost two fifths of total media ad spending. So no small potatoes. And we expect programmatic displays share of all these larger pies to continue to grow next year. It's also worth noting that programmatic displays growth rate will stay just over two percentage points higher than that of total, total digital ad spending overall. It's a testament to the flexibility programmatic buying offers, as well as continued growth in programmatic CTV, which we'll get to in the next few slides. So this year, over 90% of all digital display advertising will be transacted programmatically. And when we break out programmatic penetration by device, we see some interesting trends. On mobile devices, programmatic has accounted for over 90% of display ad spending since 2019 more than 90% of time spent on social networks takes place on mobile devices, and the vast majority of social media ads are programmatic by default, so this trend makes sense. When mobile crossed that 90% threshold in 2019, just about half of CTV ad spending was transacting programmatically. This year, three quarters of CTV ad spending will take place within programmatic channels. That's a pretty significant increase in the last couple of years. Meanwhile, we're seeing a decrease in programmatic share of display ad spending on desktop and laptop computers. And we are seeing these trends play out in how much of total programmatic display ad spending is contributed by each device. The bulk of programmatic display ad spending goes toward mobile devices. That's been the case since 2015 and it's not likely to change. But as programmatic penetration in CTV increases and the overall CTV ad market continues to grow, CTV is gaining share and will actually surpass desktop and laptop next year. These are exciting times. So that's how programmatic ad spending breaks out by device. Moving on to format. The biggest story here is that this year, ad spending in programmatic video will exceed programmatic ad spending against non-video formats for the very first time. 
And again, it really comes down to growth in programmatic CTV. Without CTV, video would account for just under 40% of programmatic display ad spending. So you've heard about the massive growth in programmatic CTV a few times so far in this presentation. And I'm sure you've heard the buzz elsewhere as well. So let's quantify that growth. Programmatic CTV is still pretty nascent relative to other programmatic channels and certainly relative to linear TV. When we started measuring programmatic CTV in 2017, it accounted for 6.5% of programmatic video ad spending. This year, one in every $5 spent in programmatic video will go to CTV. And that's quite a change in only five years time. Recent growth was propelled by a surge in CTV ad inventory as the pandemic boosted time spent with streaming video, as well as increased CTV, CTV penetration in households in the US overall. And the secret's out, advertisers will continue funneling investment into CTV and leveraging programmatic buying as they do. And so programmatic CTV will sustain double digit growth in ad spending next year as well. That said, most programmatic video ad spending goes to mobile, 65.2% in 2022. And looking at mobile and silo, spending against non-video formats actually accounts for more than half of programmatic digital display ad spending. However, I've already mentioned the influential relationship between programmatic display ad spending on mobile devices and social media advertising, and it's at work here as well. So given the increasing interest in short form video based platforms like TikTok among advertisers, we anticipate video will continue to gain share of mobile programmatic display ad spending. Finally, let's take a look at share of ad spending by transaction method. A quick refresher for anyone who needs it, programmatic transactions are carried out in several ways. We've put together a handy graphic here that identifies the four main transaction types. On the right side, we have programmatic direct deals, which specify a fixed price and may or may not guarantee a fixed inventory amount. On the left side, we have auction environments, private marketplaces or PMPs as I'll refer to them today, which are typically owned by a single publisher or a small group of publishers and are open to only a select number of invited buyers. And the open exchange, which as the name suggests, is open to all buyers and sellers in the digital ecosystem. Now, programmatic direct dominates programmatic digital display advertising. This has been the case since 2015. However, we're seeing an interesting dynamic play out between open exchange and PMPs. Advertisers continue to shift spend away from the open exchange and into PMPs, which often offer a variety of additional benefits, including inventory quality assurance, uh, protection against ad fraud, and preservation of the buyer-seller relationship. In the open exchange, anyone can sell or purchase ad inventory without either side knowing who's on the other end. In PMPs, buyers and sellers can more easily work together to achieve desirable outcomes, which is especially important as consumer data diminishes. And that's a good segue into our next topic, identity resolution. The third party identifiers upon which programmatic advertising was built have been under fire for years. Here we have have a nice timeline of major milestones in their slow demise. And Chrome is really the last holdout among major browsers to maintain infrastructures support broad use of third-party cookies. And when we talk about post-cookie targeting or measurement solutions and the cookie-less future, it's important to remember that in a way, we're already there. Firefox and Safari have blocked third-party cookies since 2019 and 2020, respectively. And mobile ad IDs are also only partially in play since Apple launched its app tracking transparency framework last year. 2022 has already been quite eventful for congressional attempts at regulating digital advertising practices. For example, the Banning Surveillance Advertising Act, which was introduced in January, would prohibit digital advertisers from engaging in any behavioral targeting practices using data that is, quote, reasonably linkable to consumers with very few exceptions. While this bill is unlikely to pass, it is further proof of legislators' enthusiasm for more restrictive data uh, protections. Regardless of whether the government passes comprehensive data privacy legislation in the near or even distant future, 
Consumers are already being bombarded with messaging telling them that they should care, and they don't need to wait on Congress to take action to protect their personal data. According to research from YouGov, only 32% of US adults agreed that when a website asks them about cookies, they always select accept all. That's the lowest percentage of any country measured. So tides really are changing and any advertisers that are clinging to the way things were risk being left behind. As the industry works on this identity challenge, the marketplace has been absolutely inundated with solutions from ad tech platforms and measurement vendors, even agencies are putting their hats in the ring. And this fragmentation is not sustainable. Over time, the most versatile, scalable, and measurable, measurable solutions will rise to the top. The biggest item on advertisers' to-do lists this year should be to test and learn. There is some skepticism about whether Google will actually deprecate third-party cookies at the end of 2023 as planned. And that's understandable, especially given recent scrutiny Google's faced on the antitrust front. Deprecating cookies would further bolster Google's dominance in the digital advertising marketplace, given the absolutely monumental amount of first-party data it possesses. So it's shrewd to interrogate Google's motivations and ensure competition is prepared to weather the storm. But like I mentioned a few slides back, third-party identifiers already have one foot out the door. And Evelyn, what's your sense of the preparedness in the market for the changes that are coming? We know that there have already been a lot of changes and more are on their way. So do you have a, a sense of survey data that shows um, either on the buy side or sell side or both um, how prepared people feel they are? Yes, we do. Um, so research suggests that there is a growing sense of preparedness among advertisers, agencies, publishers, and ad tech platforms. However, there's also research that suggests that that sense of preparedness may be unfounded based on lack of actual changes implemented to programmatic strategies and to the infrastructures that support those strategies like the collection of third-party data. So. Yes, folks are feeling generally prepared for this change, um, but there is still a need to constantly and actively evaluate the ways in which um, that, that preparation is actually taking place in organizational infrastructures. So multiple tiers of targeting are required to get the most out of our complicated ad ecosystem these days, where each bid has its own unique assortment of identifiers attached. So advertisers and publishers need to adopt some of these new identity solutions, and ad tech platforms need to provide optionality and interoperability to support their clients' initiatives on that front. Lotomi conducted a survey in September of last year and found that authenticated identifiers like hashed emails were the most widely embraced solution among marketers and publishers worldwide. Still, it remains to be seen whether consumers will opt in to any authenticated identifier at critical mass without incentive. It's unsurprising then that contextual advertising is having a renaissance of sorts, especially considering advancements in contextual tactics aided by AI and machine learning. Digiday and Kinetics found that 61% of publishers surveyed worldwide expect to see increases in contextual based ad campaign spending in 2021. Targeting techniques are just one piece of the identity puzzle. Identity also underpins ad measurement and attribution practices, which are sorely in need of some attention this year. Marketing professionals surveyed by MediaOcean in November specified improvements to non-cookie measurement techniques as the number two most impactful marketing innovation for 2022, just a few percentage points behind improvements and an integrated media planning and execution. So expect advancements to methodologies built around AI and machine learning and modeling big data, as well as enhancements to the panel-based solutions that will calibrate many of these machine-based big data methodologies. The industry will also find new uses for first and second party data and see greater adoption of tools like clean rooms to facilitate co-mingling of first party data sets in a privacy compliant manner. So, how does all of this influence costs? 
CPMs tend to be higher in, in environments where third-party identifiers are still available for targeting and measurement purposes. We see this dynamic play out on browsers. So impressions on Chrome are more expensive than impressions on Safari or Firefox. And we also see it on mobile. iOS devices are subject to Apple's app tracking transparency framework. And as of December, opt-in rates sit at about 37% according to apps flyer data. So that's almost two thirds of iOS users that are not trackable. And cross app tracking is still relatively widespread on Android devices, at least for the time being. So we see higher CPMs on Android devices versus iOS devices. And let's take meta properties as an example. Among the US clients of performance marketing agency Tenuity, meta CPMs were 45% greater on Android devices than on iOS devices in December, 2021. And this chart showcases that since the introduction of app tracking transparency, meta ad spending has seen consistently higher year over year growth rates on Android than it's seen on iOS. So from Meta's Q4 earnings a couple of weeks ago, we know the company anticipates losing about $10 billion in ad revenue as a direct result of the changes wrought by app tracking transparency. And now Google's following suit. It's phasing out cross app tracking, albeit with more warning than Apple gave and with public commitments to collaborate closely with advertisers and app developers to ensure the ad industry is ready for the change. So we'll see how that goes. But without cross app tracking capabilities on Android, we may start to see this gap in costs on Android and iOS devices start to close. All right, that brings us to our final topic, maturation in the programmatic marketplace. So programmatic buying has been around for a while now. It is no longer the new kid on the block. And like any industry, it's got a life cycle. Right now, programmatic is growing. And the digital advertising ecosystem is getting bigger every time another retailer jumps on the retail media network bandwagon. This means more programmatic inventory that's close to the, to the consumer's point of purchase. And it also brings retailers first party data into the picture, which is incredibly valuable as advertisers experience signal loss elsewhere in the digital ad ecosystem. Another function of maturation in the programmatic marketplace is consolidation. Last year was a hot one for consolidation activity among ad tech players. On the right here, we've listed a few of those high profile consolidations. Um, Magnite, the world's largest sell side platform acquired SpotX, another major SSP. Uh, mobile advertising platform, Digital Turbine, brought on mobile ad tech companies Appreciate, Ad Colony and Fiber. And the sector hit the ground running in 2022 with Twitter finalizing its sale of in-app monetization platform Mopub to AppLovin in January. And we do expect more mergers and acquisitions this year, including AppLovin's acquisition of CTV software platform Whirl, which is expected to close during the first half of this year, and Microsoft's purchase of Xander, which is still pending regulatory review. So consolidation enables ad tech partners to offer a wider variety of services to clients, as well as greater depth and breadth of technical expertise. And we're seeing things like ad verification get folded into offerings from your standard SSPs and DSPs. We're also seeing DSPs cut out SSPs entirely and go partnering directly with publishers to source programmatic inventory. The Trade Desk recently launched its open path product to that end. Consolidation also positions more ad tech players to compete more effectively with giants like Google. The playing field still isn't entirely even, hence the aforementioned antitrust scrutiny Google's been dealing with, but more alternatives is never a bad thing. And given more alternatives and the need to explore new identity solutions, advertisers are expecting to partner with nearly twice as many DSPs this year compared to last year, according to advertiser uh, perceptions. And Evelyn, is that um, mostly a function of the IDFA phase out? Are there other factors leading to that change in the, the number of DSPs? So it's, it is mostly a function of, function of privacy, <laughs> of the, the privacy landscape. Um, you know, as advertisers are, are evaluating all of these new and innovative solutions on the identity front, they are having to add more, um, more partners to their programmatic strategies. They're not, they're not like switching things out just yet, which is shrewd. You know, they're, they're keeping the ones that they are, they're tried and true partners. And they're also trying out some new ones to see what else is out there. Um, 
but having six ad or DSP partners, that's a lot to deal with. And so experts predict that many advertisers will implement supply path optimization strategies or similar initiatives to refine their programmatic supply chains and increase transparency and accountability with their programmatic partners in the next few years, kind of as, as a result of this increased um, partnership activity. Um, and, and as consolidation activity continues, it will likely get easier for advertisers to have all of their needs met by fewer partners. Um, so we'll see how that plays out as more consolidations come to the fore. Um, experts also predict that more brands will bring programmatic buying in-house, at least to some extent, over the next few years. And few brands have the resources to own and operate their own tech stack, but it's within reach for many brands to hire the necessary talent to effectively manage their own first-party data, as well as the relationships with any ad tech platforms that they choose to share that data with. With all these changes, it's important to remember the power of good creative, or rather the power of bad creative to counteract any good decisions made regarding ad tech partners and targeting strategies. With the mainstreaming of 5G on the horizon, 2022 holds massive promise as far as exciting formats go. Think augmented reality, virtual reality activations, shoppable media. But there are ways to strengthen creative strategies now, and we've listed a few best practices on the right. So number one, personalize ads wherever possible, even as consumer data becomes scarcer. So as consumers move through the funnel, different messaging will resonate. And this is not a new concept, but it can be extremely powerful and can make or break a campaign depending on the desired business outcome. Number two, make sure to match creative to its setting regardless of targeting method. So don't deploy a 30 second spot optimized for the TV glass on TikTok, right? The same campaign should look different depending on when and where it is an ad is served. And while de consumer deterministic data may get harder to come by, this kind of creative strategy can be easily implemented without it. Number three, lean into video. Video is a more effective vehicle for storytelling than static images. And when used effectively and in conjunction with number two, it can capture consumer attention in any environment. So let's review a few key takeaways from what we've discussed today. First, programmatic display ad spending is still growing and more digital ad dollars are destined for programmatic channels, particularly in CTV. Second, advertisers need to be testing and adopting new identity solutions and targeting strategies. Whether Google deprecates third-party cookies in Chrome is almost a moot point. The train has already left the station and privacy-first solutions are the way of the future. So advertisers that are actively evaluating their options and advocating for what they need are setting themselves up for success. Lastly, now is the time to optimize programmatic supply paths. Consolidation activity among ad tech vendors has real benefits for programmatic advertisers. So carefully assess which partnerships will bring the most value to programmatic strategies and eliminate partners that can't or won't increase efficiency, transparency, and accountability. These practices will help reduce friction in programmatic buying and put advertisers in the best position possible to navigate the rough waters ahead as third party identifiers finally breathe their last breath. Over to you, Paul. Well, that was great. Thank you, Evelyn. Before we get to your live questions, we're now joined by Mike Peralta, Vice President and General Manager at Marketing Solutions a Division of T-Mobile USA. Thanks again for being here, Mike. Thank you. So let's jump into these questions. Um, before we get started with the Q&A, Mike, can you tell us a little bit and tell the audience about T-Mobile's Marketing Solutions Group? Uh, sure, uh, happy to. At, um, at Marketing Solutions, uh, which is a part of T-Mobile, we've uh, built a platform where uh, brands and agencies can uh, create and develop uh, audience segments and run campaigns based on those audiences across the network of uh, you know, very, uh, very similar to you know, a, a few other platforms in the marketplace. However, our differentiator is that we leverage our first party uh, mobile network data from T-Mobile's network with uh, insights from over 100 million plus uh, diverse customers. 
And, and from that, we've developed products such as um, AppGraph and AppGraph Plus, which enables uh, marketers uh, to create audience segments built on app ownership, app usage, and behaviors, right? Cross app uh, uh, usage, uh, which are I I insights that, um, that, that, that frankly hasn't, uh, hasn't been accessible to brands before. And how are you and the team handling the uncertainty that's happening as third-party identifiers are slowly phased out? Do you have any tips for marketers? Uh, looking yeah, sure. And, and I thought that was a great uh, presentation, uh, Evelyn. It's, 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 it's like a summary of uh, all the years that I've been in this industry. <laughs> it's, it's all coming to a head now. That being said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm actually pretty excited about being in industry today. I, I don't think there's been a better time to be in this industry. Because you know, first of all, there's 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 more people with more mobile phones, and there's more people who are buying more stuff online, right? And that's going to continue to increase. And and you know, I I don't think uh, while you know third party cookies are going away, right? I mean, some of the tips that we give you know our customers are hey, focus on first party data. Uh, depending on the on the customer or the marketer, you have your own first party data, and you have partners who have a ton of first party data. Uh, and when you look at identity, uh, yes, there are a number of providers out there. We just have to be smart about it, right? Uh, test identity providers, no one size fits all. You may need to work on on and, and, and use a few today. And and the, the third bit is is you know the 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 mobile device is uh, you know something that all of us use every day, right? So, so I think I was reading a stat that consumers use their phone something like ninety six times a day. It's probably it's actually probably double that based on my my my, my usage. Um, so, so mobile is not just a ancillary strategy anymore, right? Our 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 view our view is mobile needs to be front and center, uh, particularly mobile video as, as as part of your your in, in, in entire marketing strategy. And speaking of video, Mike, twenty twenty two marks the first year that video will surpass non video formats in programmatic ad spending. Besides CTV, are there other video opportunities where you're seeing a lot of growth? Uh, yeah, sure. I think, uh, and and I think you're 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 seeing this today. While you know, we 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 just recently acquired a company called uh, Octopus, which puts tablets in the back of Uber and Lyft vehicles. It's the largest rideshare network of drivers, with over fifteen thousand uh, drivers today in over fifty markets, which will be uh, doubling this year. And within those tablets, we provide. Um, uh, highly interactive games and video content for the writers, right, for the consumer. Uh, and within that, uh, we provide uh, premium video ads, right, which is delivered to a highly captive audience within sort of a gamified experience. Um, lots of reach, lots of impressions, 100 billion plus monthly with, uh, 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 with 30 second uh, video impressions, 80% uh, uh, targeted towards that that age group of 18 to 49. So, so highly engaged uh, audience. And then I think the other piece is CCPA compliant, GDPR compliant, 100% 100, uh, 100 viewable. Um, and you know, to what uh, Evelyn, Evelyn was saying uh, earlier, uh, you know, uh, creative is important, <laughs> right? I, I, I think uh, you, know, you, you don't wanna waste your great targeting when, and, 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 and come up with a less than interesting piece of creative. So, so, so we focus on highly interactive uh, sight sounded motion uh, branded uh, games as well, right? So, so, so it's super exciting what we're trying to do in, in, uh, in, in, in Roger. Yeah. Um, so Mike, what do you think marketers today are struggling with the most? What, what challenges are they facing that particularly stand out to you? Yeah, I, I think a couple of things. Well, well first of all, if, if, if you compare today to just say 10 years ago or, or 15 years ago as a consumer, it's better for me, right? As, as a consumer, I have more control today. Uh, you know, I, 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 I use my, my phone uh, and, and use a number of different apps. If, if I'm looking for something, it's easy for me to find information, right? So, so, so to a certain extent, the consumer has more control and the consumer has more power, which is, uh, which is great for the consumer. And for the marketer, the marketer has to think different, right? It, it, it's, uh, to me, it's no longer that, you know, purchase funnel that, that we all think about. Uh, or, or, or that we've used in the past. Like at any given time, myself as a consumer, uh, I'm, I'm in buying mode at any given time, right? Because of, because of my mobile device, right? So, so as, as you think about that, part of the challenge is there is a lot of complexity, 
right? It's it's it, it's it's hard to believe that the marketers are going to use a lot more DSPs today than they did five years ago. <laughs> But uh, but it is it's true right so so there's and then within uh, things like um, you know Apple privacy changes uh, Google deprecating the third party cookie we, we 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 as a marketer we still have to understand what works versus what doesn't right so, so I think in in the short run it's going to be harder for me as a marketer to do that I'm going to have to use more tools I'm going to have to understand data better. I'm just going to have to be better, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and then I think, to, to me, in, in the end, while, while that is challenging, I, I think it's better for our industry uh, overall, right? I, I think as, as we get sort of uh, past this and beyond this, um, it's going to be, the, the, the internet is going to be a great place for the consumer, and it's going to be great for a place for the advertiser, right? Because we're going to think through all of the, think through all of the data, understand first party, understand how that works for consumers and, and be able to really provide a great, great experience for the consumer. So Mike, I want to ask you one more question in the minute yeah. that we have left before the audience Q and A. Uh, Evelyn mentioned 5G making new formats more widely available. What other benefits will, will 5G bring to the ad ecosystem this year, you think? Well, I, I, uh, I, I I, I guess I'll sort of answer that in, in, in this year, but in upcoming years, I'm excited about this year. I'm more excited about the stuff that we haven't figured out yet, right? I, I think within this year, you know, 5G experience is, is going to help create, you know, richer, uh, richer content, richer advertising, more engaging video advertising, right? I, th I think there's going to be new units and, and, and new effective creative that's going to be uh, driven because you have more bandwidth. Uh, formats within, you know, VR or AR, I think are going to start expanding you know, multiverse has been on the tip of everybody's tongue, right? We're, we're, we're not there yet, but it, 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 it's coming up. And even simple things like uh, shoppable media, right? The ability to, you know, within your phone, because of 5G, you could try something on, <laughs> right? You can look at things in, in, in 3D, uh, right? I, I, and then I think the other piece is with, uh, and, and this is probably a little bit further down the road, you know, with, with 5G that enables autonomous cars. And once you have autonomous cars, that's an additional place to consume content, right? And, and, and so that to, to me, there's going to be a, a super interesting ecosystem that, that comes out of that as well. Well, thank you, Mike. Those are great insights. And um, now let's move on to the audience Q&A. We received a lot of great questions. We will start with this one from John in Portland, Maine, a place I know and love. Um, why is programmatic share of display ad spending on desktop and laptop decreasing? Um, and Evelyn, that one's for you, but Mike, feel free to chime in as well if you'd like. Sure. Well, the biggest driver behind that trend is streaming video. So when we look at CTV, which is for all intents and purposes comprised entirely of streaming video, um, we see three quarters of ad dollars are transacting programmatically one quarter is not. And we see that trend very clearly in CTV because it's relatively new and it started from zero programmatic penetration. And we can see that in recent years. But since consumers are also spending more time streaming video on their computers, their desktop and laptop computers, that, that roughly 25% of dollars that are not transacting programmatically brings the programmatic share of ad, ad spending on desktop and laptop down a little bit. There are also some smaller trends at play here, um, like within B2B, advertising, there are some uh, custom content and sponsorship activations on platforms like LinkedIn that happen to skew more towards desktop that are becoming more common. So it's a combination of things, but really that that streaming video trend is the biggest driver. Mike, anything to add on that? Yeah, I think there's one thing to add, you know, since I do work for a mobile uh, company, <laughs> that uh, there, there is, uh, you know, the, the consumer is more on mobile. And I don't know, you know, certainly if you have if you have kids, uh, you know, I have, I have daughters that uh, just graduated uh, from, from college and, uh, you know, they're on their mobile device all the time. They don't even own, own TVs, right? That's a little bit of an extreme case, but... Uh, but, but there, there is a lot more uh, 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 content. And as I said earlier, with, with, with 5G, your, your mobile device becomes you know, uh, just a much better experience for you today than it was before. Okay, um, side note, Mike, after uh, offline, we'll have to trade stories about our daughters and their media habits, but we'll, <laughs> we won't draw the audience into that. The next question comes from Phoebe in Philadelphia, the uh, city of sisterly love. Why does programmatic 
direct command such a high share of programmatic display ad spending, Evelyn? In short, it's because of the social media. Uh, the vast majority of display ads on social are programmatic. And since they are purchased directly with the specific network, they're programmatic direct. And so when you think about how much of programmatic display ad spending occurs on mobile devices, it's about 75% this year, and how much of that mobile activity occurs on social media, makes sense to have programmatic direct as the top, the top transaction method. The next question comes from Danny in Miami, and I think this is probably directed at both of you, Evelyn and Mike. So um, you mentioned that digital out of home, um, you, you mentioned digital out of home at the top of the presentation. How has programmatic digital out of home fared over the last few years with the pandemic reducing foot traffic at times? So on the whole, um, out of home didn't weather the pandemic very well. As stay at home orders proliferated at the start of the pandemic, we saw a drastic decrease in ad spending in out of home. And we estimate that by 2025, ad spending in out of home still won't have returned to pre-pandemic levels. Digital out of home also saw a pretty major decrease in 2020, but rebounded in 2021 and will return to pre-pandemic levels by 2025. So comparatively, programmatic digital out of home has prospered. Um, it's seen positive growth throughout the pandemic, both in 2020 and 2021. Granted, that growth was from a relatively small base, um, but it's still noteworthy and, and is attributable to the flexibility that programmatic buying offers in really any channel that, that, that those pipes are available in. So adoption did increase in programmatic digital out of home throughout the pandemic. And there's some really neat stuff going on. Um, so we like um, the ability to target based on real time localized data like traffic patterns really cool. Um, so this year, we expect programmatic digital out of home to account for about 5% of all out of home ad spending. And that share will continue to grow over the next few years. Yeah, no, I, 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 I just want to add to that. I mean, if, if you look in particular to sort of how our, our ride share um, group is, uh, is, is doing, uh, you know, certainly they were uh, hit during uh, COVID, but, you know, not, knock on wood. Uh, it's it's growing by orders of magnitude today, right? So, so I'm 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 super bullish on uh, on on digital out of home. You know what what what's super interesting about digital out of home and particularly ride shares is it, it really offers the, the the market and the ability to to, to really um, get in front of their audience in in a much different way, <laughs> right? In in a, in a way that the consumer um, you know it's it's front and center and and, and you really garner their attention. And the fact that it's programmatic now is, is you have a lot more data to understand, um, you know, how people react and and uh, what those audiences work and what the what the audiences don't work. So, so we're we're super bullish on uh, on digital out of home. Great, um, Tom in Hawaii is asking, how are CTV prices affected by changes in the privacy landscape? It's a great question. Um, so CTV does not rely on cookies. In fact, the market is, is dominated by Amazon Fire TV and Roku devices that still have device identifiers in place. And that's not to say that changes in the privacy landscape don't touch CTV uh, at all. I mean, the conversation about consumers' data privacy really does apply to any addressable format. But there's not really an immediate shift that's affecting costs in the same way that we see in browser and on mobile devices. Now, that said, CTV prices are generally pretty high, um, one of the reasons being that um, the amount of inventory available, you know, it did explode last year and in, pre in years previous as well as, as um, streaming on TV devices proliferated, but there's still less inventory than, say, banner ads on websites on the sell side's long tail. So that that inventory kind of discrepancy does contribute to high prices in CTV. Okay, and um, question from Diana in Carson City. Can you talk more about contextual targeting? What is it and why are advertisers increasing their spend on it? Or as you put it, why is it put back in vogue, I think you said. <laughs> sure. 
So contextual targeting delivers relevant ads based on congruence between the characteristics of the content adjacent to the ad placement and characteristics of the ad itself. So for example, an ad for a pair of running shoes would be placed next to an influencer's blog post about training for a marathon. Um, and advertisers are increasing their spend on contextual targeting because it doesn't rely on consumers' behavioral data, which is in jeopardy at this point. Um, it's based on basically an assumption that folks reading a blog post about training for a marathon might be training for a marathon themselves, or at least be interested in running as a hobby or a form of exercise. So there, there is plenty of data out there that proves the effectiveness of those assumptions, especially as contextual processes become uh, better and the automation um, kind of pieces that, that build out that contextual arsenal get better as well, things like uh, natural language processing. Um, but leveraging contextual targeting is one way to rely less heavily on data that's in jeopardy right now as third-party identifiers go away. So it's a really, um, it's a really booming area of at least testing and learning, but a lot of advertisers will probably find that it's a, a, an effective way and shift some, some investment there permanently. Okay, um, so full disclosure, I've been researching um, running a marathon, but it's strictly for a friend, so please nobody target that specifically. <laughs> um, but seriously, we have uh, one last question. I think the point about DSPs resonated because we actually had a few questions come in about it, of which we only have time for this one from Bruce in New York. Uh, he's asking, why are marketers increasing the number of DSPs they work with? I know we touched on it a little bit. He's also asking what gaps and capabilities are they looking to fill or what shortfalls or disadvantages are they seeing with their current DSP partners? I, I, I think that is a, a bit of a complex question, but Evelyn or Mike, any thoughts on that would be welcome. Sure. I mean, yeah, it is really complex and it goes back to something Mike mentioned a little bit earlier, which is that it's there is no one size fits all solution. And right now, all advertisers are trying to to take advantage or they should be trying to take advantage of the massive amount of in innovation that's going on, particularly in identity, but also in, in places like ad verification, ad fraud prevention. There are there is a lot of innovation going on and not every vendor has access to every solution, and especially not every vendor has access to every solution at the caliber that another vendor has. So we're just in a period right now, it's part of like a programmatic um, life cycle situation. We're in a period of, of innovation and as consolidation continues, we will start seeing those different capabilities get folded in and fewer advertisers will be able to have all of those, those smaller, uh, maybe not smaller, but those individual needs addressed by fewer partners. Um, but it's just a, a function of really, it is a function of maturation in the marketplace where we're not quite yet at the level of consolidation where we could maintain that like three-ish DSPs level given everything going on in identity. Yeah. And I, I, I think that's right. I, I think the one thing that I would add is is, is that it's um, we're, we're also as an industry a victim of our own success, right? I mean, as, as as you saw from the trends over the years, if 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 we if it was only desktop display <laughs> that we would want to optimize on from an inventory or, or DSP perspective, we probably wouldn't have you know all of those these different layers. But then you add, hey, third party cookies going away. Oh, you add mobile. Oh, you add affiliate. Oh, you have search. Oh, you've got social. Oh, you've got CTV. So pretty soon, you know that great DSP that you used a few years ago that was great on desktop display, uh, uh, probably isn't the one that you're going to use on connected TV, or isn't the one that has a great mobile bidder, right? So, so things are happening fast. Uh, I do agree with Evelyn, though. I, I think at some point. Um, you know, things are going to consolidate, and, and and you are going to be able to go to, you know, one group or one entity that 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 really has the best of all worlds. I I think we're still we're probably still a little ways away. Great. Well, that is all the time we have for today. So thanks again to Evelyn for joining us, and a very special thanks to Mike mm -hmm. and to the team at Marketing Solutions, a division of T-Mobile USA. I would like to give a shout out to our eMarketer production crew behind the scenes. Um, huge thank you to them for making this webinar possible. And as promised, we'll be emailing you soon with a link to the slides and the full recording. Before we wrap up, 
I'd like to take a moment to tell you what's happening across eMarketer's media channels. You can register for upcoming live analyst and tech talk webinars at eMarketer.com slash webinars. On the audio side, don't forget to tune in to Behind the Numbers, eMarketer's daily podcast at eMarketer.com slash podcast. And finally, please check out our newsletters. So, so thank you again for joining us and enjoy the rest of your workday.